Hello everyone and welcome back to True Footy. Today I am going to be doing a video looking back at the ladder prediction I did at the start of the season back when I lived in Australia a long time ago now. In that video, like I do every year, I did a ladder prediction of where I thought that all 18 teams would finish in 2023. In today's video, I'm going to be looking back at what I said in that video and laughing at how ridiculously wrong I got some of them and kind of rejoicing at how some of them were actually not too bad. So what you can expect from this video is a, a pretty mixed bag of some horrible calls by me and then some ones I'm kind of proud of, but generally it's been bad calls. Before we get into the video, I do want to kind of address something that I saw on Facebook or somebody sent me on Facebook. Okay, so there was a post uh, by some North Melbourne fan page on Facebook saying that True Footy Podcast is reporting that Riley Bonner uh, and North Melbourne, there's a link there. There, or some story about how North Melbourne might sign Riley Bonner. Now I've got to say this this may be laugh because um, as you know if you've been watching the channel for a while I am not a journalist. I do not have any inside scoop or anything to report okay. I'm not Tom Morris. I'm here to talk about things that could happen potentially or things that have happened definitely. Sometimes I'll speculate on rumors but there will be rumors where I will generally name a source. Second to this point I did not say that at all about Riley Bonner going to North Melbourne. I did release a video about the listed free agents uh, earlier this week. I I think, in which Riley Bonner was one of them who may find a new club, but I watched it back this morning. I didn't even mention North Melbourne once. So look, benefit of the doubt, there seems to be some confusion there. Some people in the comments also said, well, there was one comment that said, I don't believe a lot of what True Footy says. Again, I want to clarify, I'm not here trying to tell people new breaking stories. I'm here to comment on what other people have said. And in this case, I didn't even say the damn thing. Anyway, it's kind of funny, but I just want to clarify that for anyone who saw that or is still getting a feel for what this channel is. Not all journalists. Let's move on. All right, so the format of the video will be, I'll roll a clip or a section of the clip where I talk about my given prediction from 18th to 1st, and then I will react to it. So let's start with the video. For this year's Wooden Spoon, after much thought and heavy consideration, I've got to say Hawthorne, to be honest, and my gut feel is that this team will prove me wrong because notoriously, they just play well for no reason sometimes. You know, they'll have a, a downward trend to form and then some young guns will play out of their skin. So I'm expecting a bit of that from Hawthorne this year. But if you look at their best 22, all the players that they, you know, willingly offloaded, Gunston, um, O'Meara and Mitchell in particular from that midfield, there's a lot resting suddenly on the shoulders of young mids like Newcomb and Warple, who I think are great players uh, or potentially great players. Warple dropped off a little bit. Carl Amon comes into the side, but then still Josh Ward and Will Day are still quite young and Will Day, I'm optimistic about but that's uh it's not a best 22 midfield or a best six or seven midfield that inspires a massive amount of confidence that they're actually going to win games okay so straight off the bat not a great call Hawthorne obviously did not win the wooden spoon they did finish 16th which is not much higher that's only two spots higher but there obviously was still a big gulf between Hawthorne and the bottom two teams particularly in the second half of the year um, they really came on I overrated the extent to which their midfield would be exposed with uh, a lot of the experience lost the midfield was a relative strength regardless and it, I will say that they probably did kind of look like spoon contenders until they they played West Coast in Tasmania. Not only did they annihilate West Coast, but they went on to play a lot better footy than that, uh, beat Collingwood later in the year. So uh, yeah, no points for this one. In 17th spot, I've got North Melbourne improving by one position and avoiding the wooden spoon. I don't think they were as bad as they showed last year. Um, in the same way I've made that case for West Coast, North aren't that bad in terms of the list talent they've got. They played well below their potential. It was a pretty terrible season in terms of what they produced. So I just think with new coach and uh, you know a refreshed sort of mindset going into this year. They've got to improve, but the thing is, they can still improve by three wins, and that will still only be five wins, which would give them you know 17th spot most likely. I think there's a lot of upside. LDU is about to explode. Big fan of Simkin and Stevenson in terms of their potential and Zerha. All these guys are hitting that age where they might explode and under Clarkson, that could happen. But I'm not going to bet on it. They'll have excitement out of guys like Sheasel, big chance for the rising star. Uh, but overall. They'll improve, but not by enough to get out of the bottom two. So North Melbourne, I had 17th and they finished 17th on the ladder. Um, I did, I was pretty buoyant on them in a sense that I thought they had plenty of reasons to improve, but let's be honest, they really didn't improve. Um, they weren't really any better than the previous year. They did move up one spot on the ladder, but obviously that's a low bar and you know, West Coast were putrid as well. Look, they did have some adversity. A highlighter LDU is a potential breakout player. He battled some injury this year. And obviously they spent a large part of the season without Alistair Clarkson. Um, I made a good call on Sheasel, but overall, North didn't improve as much as I expected them to, uh, but still, I actually got this bang on, so I'll take the points for that one. In 16th, we have GWS, who I wanted to give the wooden spoon, but upon careful consideration, 
even though they lost Toronto and Hopper. When you compare it to some of the other bottom sides, there's still a few established stars in that side. They've got Whitfield, Green, Haynes, uh, and then former guns, I guess, in Ward and Cornelia, who, you know, I say former guns, they're still good players, and I'm backing them in to have better seasons. Again, GWS are another side who finished, I think it was a third last or something last year. And I don't think that is a true reflection of the talent on their list, but obviously they, they got rid of their coach, which is a reflection of that. And there's some really good young players. Sam Taylor was All-Australian, and uh, Tom Green could and should take his game to the next level this year. But overall, I'm pessimistic. And I don't think they'll be as bad as uh, the wooden spoon, but there's enough talent to warrant them avoiding the bottom two. Okay, we have our first horrible call of this particular video. I had GWS coming third last, and they made a prelim. Now, in my defense somewhat, Factor in the fact that they were third last the previous year, I was pretty much doubling down on them, staying around the same part of the ladder, and they'd lost to Ron Toronto and Hopper. Oh my god, I nearly said Toronto again. What is that? They started the year poorly, and then they exploded midway through the year under Adam Kingsley, so well done to them. I uh, I did see some quality. I never would have foreseen them making it all the way to the prelim, so well done, GWS. Rounding out my bottom four, I've got Essendon. Now, I can't lie to you, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this prediction. I feel like it's just kind of an easy thing to slot them back roughly where they finished last year. In fact, it's the same spot as they finished last year. Their best 22 is solid enough. You know, their, their midfielders are solid, well, better than solid uh, in Darcy Parrish, Zach Merritt, and then Dylan Shield as well. They're spearheaded by Peter Wright, who's turned into an absolute gun, to be honest with you. And there's some good uh, defenders down back, although they're probably lacking that real tall uh, shutdown defender as well. But they've got some good uh, shorter players. They do have Brad Scott coming in, and this guy is a coach. While he didn't have a massive success at North Melbourne, I think he did prove that he could extract the best out of a playing group that is not massively talented. I'm not saying that's... Essendon. I think there is some definitely some young talent there, but I could see this guy building them to a level this year where they avoid the bottom four, but he will need time. And to be honest with you, my trust with Essendon is a little bit low after a poor last, a poor year last year. So, okay, Essendon, I had rounding out my bottom four and they ended up finishing at 11th. Now they had finished bottom four the previous year as well in 2022. So I didn't really foresee much improvement and they did improve. They, they improved quite markedly. They had some pretty good performances throughout the year. Nothing really breathtaking. They did, I remember the, the gather round where they beat Melbourne. Um, that is a clear improvement on the previous year and their best football was pretty reasonable. Uh, but it was a pretty poor end of the season as well, seeing them slide down to 11th. So underrated Essendon here. I think this will ruffle some feathers because I've talked them up and I'm actually really optimistic on them, but I've ended up putting Adelaide here and there's a ruffling feathers pun because of Crows. I think they're an exciting young side and I think to some extent to this point, They've actually exceeded the talent level in terms of how competitive they are, the spirit that they play with, their ability to beat teams. That talent is starting to take shape now, and I think their forward line in particular, as it was in like that 2017 era, could become a massive strength for them, for them going forward from this year. I think the talent's getting there, but I still think they're another season away from being consistent enough for finals. So I think they'll be consistently tough to beat at home, but in the end, not talented enough yet or maybe not, maybe not experienced enough yet to be consistent enough to really push for final. Hmm, this is where I badly underrated Adelaide. So Adelaide, I had them 14th, they ended up finishing 10th. They had finished 14th the year before that, so I expected them to stagnate as such, but obviously massively underrated their improvement. I nailed some points, you know, I talked about their forward line and their home ground advantage, but obviously still underrated them to a good extent. And to be honest, they should have played finals. Obviously there was a big um, umpiring discrepancy at the end of the year. Very controversial, should have played finals. And to be honest, I'm expecting a big 2024 from Adelaide. I underrated where they were at this year, but I do think I'm gonna back them in for finals and potentially, you know, deep into finals next year. In 13th spot, I finally put my West Coast Eagles here and I've been all over the place with my predictions with them because um, it's hard not to, to, it's hard to separate your head from your heart. There will be genuine improvement there. It has to be, but it's largely predicated on availability of players. And there's so many players coming back into the side, it's ridiculous. I can't count them all, but three that come to mind are Elliot Yo barely played. He's close to our best player. Oscar Allen didn't play at all. Sheed played one game. And these guys are on the prime in their career. So again, similar to Adelaide, I think they'll be tough to beat at home. And I think there's, you know, when you compare them to Adelaide, I think the best 22 is a little bit more established, a little bit more consistent. I mean, I've only got them one spot, spot apart. The reliance on Nick Nat's dominance is their biggest Achilles heel going into this year. Oh, that's a pun. He's currently got a sore Achilles. That wasn't intentional. But I think if he misses games, which is, you know, every chance, then I think the Eagles will get exposed. And I don't think the midfield is potent enough to overcome the cracks that would be there. 
Okay, this is horrible. I had West Coast above Adelaide. I do remember copping shit for this at the time, so well done, everyone. I, uh, I deserve the heat that I copped in the preseason. One thing, I'm trying to think of ways to defend this. Uh, one thing I did say in the video, a lot, a lot of it was predicated on availability of players, and I talk at length about Nick Nat being important. We didn't see Nick Nat at all. The injury list was worse than it was in 2022, uh, which explains some of the shitness, but not all of it. So I'm not going to defend it too hard. We still suck. Um, if, you know, best case scenario, if we had all our players back this year. I think we started the year well when we did have a pretty good injury list, uh, list even without Nick Nat. Had we translated that form in the first three rounds across the whole year, you know, we might have avoided the bottom four. But again, we still probably would have been worse than Hawthorne and Gold Coast. So I'll just cop the L for this one and having them above. Adelaide is horrible. In 12th, I've got St. Kilda. Uh, again, another one I find it so hard to peg these guys because they can be all over the place. Last year, uh, they finished 10th and they squandered a start of 8-3. and three. I think they fell off the perch hard and that could carry into next year. I just don't think I see it with their best 22 to be a realistic chance for finals this year where I think there will be some very good contenders. They're also without King for the first six weeks of the season. Membry's in a race to be fit for round one, so we'll see. But King is a massive loss. It's a talented midfield, but it's a workman-like one. I do think Ross Lyon will set them on the straight and narrow, but he's not going to do it in season one, is my prediction, and that's why they're 12th. So St. Kilda I had in 12th, and they ended up finishing 6th this year. And I think some of the observations I made there were pretty sound, but I did underrate Ross Lyon's ability to get them playing his defensive brand of football so well straight away. Now, uh, while they started the year really well, uh, you know, what are they, five out of the first six? I can't remember his specifics, but they started the year really well, but they have continued this trend for a second year in a row of finishing seasons poorly. Not quite as poorly as the previous year, but I think when they made the finals, which is a good achievement, they were still probably the weakest team in that finals mix. So either way, again, I still underrated them. Ross Lyon did a pretty good job in his first year. In 11 spot, I've got the Gold Coast Suns, uh, and they've taken good strides consistently over the years, year by year, close to linear improvement under Stewie Jew. And 11th spot would actually be their best ever finish. So I don't think I'm ragging them too hard by not having them closer to the finals. It's potentially very solid midfield now with uh, Jared Witts in the ruck, tapping it down to Tuke Miller, potential Brownlow medalist, and we know who Rowell and Anderson are. And they could be on the verge of a breakout. So again, organic improvement could really shift Gold Coast one way or the other. Importantly, Ben King returns to this side as the mainstay key forward, and you add in uh, Lacocious and Chol, and I think as a, as a trio, there's there's a bit of danger there. They lose Rankin, but overall, there's a bit of a dangerous element to that forward line. I don't have them quite in the finals mix just yet, but they'll be close. I had the Gold Coast Suns 11th, they finished 15th. Uh, I expected some linear improvement under Stewie Jew and it did not come. And that is reflected by the fact that Gold Coast sacked their coach because obviously their expectations were higher as well. So it was a backwards year for Gold Coast in the sense that going back to the bottom four is a pretty bad regression. Losing Took Miller didn't help. He obviously had a, a pretty big injury, but they underachieved this year, quite a poor season. But uh, you know, with Damien Hardwick there now, I feel a little bit more confident about them going forward. In 10th spot, I have the Western Bulldogs. And again, this side, it's its an agonizing prediction, this one. Uh, I've been all over the place myself, uh, but they've also been all over the place over the last few years in terms of where they finish. Last year, they snuck into the top eight due to Carlton's loss in the final round to Collingwood. They got through on percentage. They let slip something like a seven goal lead in the elimination final and lost to Fremantle. Um, so a pretty disappointing way to end that year and, and it kind of belied the talent that they've got on their list. So again, it's probably just a lack of genuine faith in the Bulldogs, which means that I'll get that wrong and then they'll absolutely deliver on that promise this year. So the Bulldogs, I had 10th, they ended up finishing 9th. And for once, I've actually kind of been on the money with the Western Bulldogs who've notoriously evaded me every single year. I tip them to do poorly, they do well and vice versa. But this is the year I thought they would just slip out of the eight. And that's exactly what happened. Again, this isn't a, a, a rating of their, their quality. I think their quality, particularly their top end is outstanding. Marcus Bontempelli has a good case to be made for being the best player in the competition right now. Uh, but it was just a faith, the faith in the team to really achieve. Like I watched them play against West Coast. Marcus Bontempelli was the best player on the field, say for maybe Jamie Cripps, but they just couldn't rise to the occasion when they needed to. And, you know, two late losses in the year to Hawthorne or West Coast cost them finals ultimately. Again, they loom as another tough team to predict in 2024. In ninth spot, this is the prediction that will cop the most negative attention. I've got Fremantle sliding out of the eight this year, and this was a tough decision. I don't see Fremantle regressing badly. I think the top eight will genuinely be tough this year. There's a lot of teams, 
Uh, you know, I just had the Western Bulldogs in 10th. They made the finals last year. There's a lot of teams that are competing for eight spots. It's, it's going to be a tough top eight to crack. And with Fremantle, I don't think we can underrate losing Lobb, who kicked 36 goals last year in an area of relative weakness for them. David Mundy has been an absolute star for a long time, but even late in his career. Griffin Logue and Blake Akers, um, you know, Blake Akers had a terrific year last year. And Logue, they probably won't miss structurally because, you know, he found himself in and out of that side, sort of played forward as well. I do think overall, losing those players will have an impact. I think Fremantle have lost a bit in terms of depth and structure. I think they're tremendously talented. Don't get it twisted. That young midfield, uh, and then there's some, you know, flank- flankers like Hayden Young as well. Jai Amos has a stack of potential as a top 10 pick. I just don't think this is the year. So I think they'll stagnate as a young group and they'll be better for it and they'll come back hard in 2024. So I was cautious about putting Fremantle outside at my top eight to appear not biased. So I'm a little bit relieved that uh, this one was sort of bang on. They, I, I predicted ninth, they finished 14th, but it was pretty even around that range. They weren't really that far off the finals. Like I said, it was pretty even. I think they started the year poorly, um, came back well in the middle of the year. They beat Geelong at GMHBA. They beat the D's in Melbourne. Um, they looked pretty solid at one point and then you know finished the season a little bit aimlessly as well. But I highlighted the the loss of all their depth to be an inhibitor for them and uh, I expected them to stagnate and that's what happened. I selected Port Adelaide scraping in to my top eight. I really wanted to put the power in the top eight. I just think they're too good to leave out. Yes, they had a disappointing year last year. They started 0-5. They went 10-7 and after that, which showed they kind of got their shit together. And in that 22 that they have, I think it stacks up really, really well. And I think eight could be conservative. I think this team has the potential to really contend for the flag. It is potential though. They burned us last year. We all predicted them to go close. They got nowhere near it. But their best 22 sells me hard. You got Boke and Wines. Obviously, Boke is a fine wine. Wines, uh, there's a pun there. I can't be bothered making it. Uh, Connor Rosie is a potential A-grade superstar as well. And he's going to be another year older this year. Zach Butters, Jason Horn Francis. All these guys just have untapped potential. This is the year it could click. I say the same thing every year about Zach Butters. But this could be the year. So, Port made the finals after all. Uh, Not only did they make the finals, they finished third this year, and uh, it was a good prediction, but I was probably too conservative. I really saw the potential with Port Adelaide this year, and to some extent, I correctly forecasted how well some of those young players were going to take the next step in 2023, and uh, I'm pretty comfortable with that. Obviously, I underrated them, but they had finished 11th the previous year, so me expecting them to improve and play finals, I think that's an okay prediction. Not bang on, but it's, it's a decent prediction. In seventh spot, I have got the Collingwood Footy Club who enthralled the AFL world last year by finishing top four. They've lost Grundy, they lost uh, Ollie Henry as well. They've added Tom Mitchell, Dan McStay, Bobby Hill and uh, Frampton as well as a key defender. So they've reinforced their midfield and I think most important of all, they've got a mainstay key forward option. They were probably the most exciting side to watch last year and the question will be, can they back it up after an emotional roller coaster? And they, they probably will, to be honest. And seventh might seem a little bit harsh, but I don't think Collingwood are necessarily an entrenched top four lock in this year. So that's why I've got them in seventh. But again, they're good enough to go all the way and win the flag. I know that sounds stupid, but I equally believe both things. Ah, okay, all right, that, that, that one's not good. Uh, I had Collingwood in seventh, and obviously they won the premiership this year. I think a lot of the basis for my logic for this was they'd won so many close games last year that I thought, you know, statistically speaking, they'll drop a few more of those this year. And uh, what we saw this year was that didn't happen. They improved from fourth to first, uh, played great team football, probably didn't expect Dacos to come on in the way that he did. And uh, yeah, that's a bad prediction. I'll, I'll cop that as a bad one. In sixth, I've got Richmond. Their one greatest weakness last year in terms of list balance from my perspective, and I think it's plain to see, was their midfield. And they already finished, I think it was seventh last year and lost that elimination final. They've added two potentially elite midfielders in Tim Taranto and Jacob Hopper. So I don't think I've ever seen a midfield get that much of a facelift, that much of an upgrade in one single off season. And there may be some teething issues, but now that is a genuinely decent midfield. Yes, their best players are past their prime, but there's still some young talent there to come in and support that. And there's a bit more of a better list transition, I think, for Richmond. So I think they're going to be around the mix again. I don't consider them a serious flag contender because... Probably too many of those players are past their prime. Ugh, this one's also not good. Richmond, uh, I had them in sixth. They finished 13th. Again, in my defense, they finished sixth the year before and then added Taranto and Hopper. I said Taranto correctly this time. So the logic was there for a um, for another finals appearance for Richmond. And, uh, you know, what we saw this year was probably a bit of burnout from their coach. And then the subsequent coach uh, probably didn't quite have the same tools 
to re-energize a list that had probably gone past its prime. And uh, obviously Hardwick felt the same way. He didn't have the energy to go again for what is what I would say now at this current moment in time is a modestly talented list. So bad prediction, but they did fall a long way from last year. In fifth spot, I have the runners up from last year, the Sydney Footy Club. Again, this one might be controversial because they've been a great side for two years consistently. There's tons of organic improvement that come from Sydney as well. There's so much young talent or at least players that are just not quite in their prime yet. They're, they're delivering earlier than expected. And there's still a lot of improvement to come with guys like Logan McDonald, uh, Braden Campbell, Errol Golden. I, I could go on and on. There's so many young players that will take this side through for the next 10 years. Because they've improved so much quicker than expected, I think it's kind of quite possible that we see a year of stagnation from Sydney. And I'm still only putting from second to fifth. Um, but they may dip down and come back up. And that's kind of the vibe I have with Sydney. It's not a talent issue. Um, and you also factor in, they got absolutely belted in the grand final. And statistically, that has a negative impact on teams the next year for whatever reason. So Sydney, I had fifth. They finished eighth. Um, I'm okay with this prediction. I somewhat got some of the logic right of it. Um, what we didn't see coming was a decimated backline, which arguably cost the games throughout the year as well. Uh, I would give them some credit for coming back in the way that they did through the second half of the year, sort of re-emerged back as a finals contender, but again, eliminated week one. So it's unclear to what extent the grand final had on that. Who knows? But they'll be okay. They'll be okay long term. In fourth spot, I've got my surprise packet this year, Carlton. This is, their, this is their time. There's always a surprise packet this year. And I did say last year that I was going to stop predicting these things because they blow up in my face so consistently. But Carlton, I think there's a lot of good, solid logic as to why I think they could be a potential powerhouse in the years to come. Their tall timber is arguably the best in the league. Mackay and Kurnow as a forward duo. You've got Weedering down the other end as well. On top of that, a midfield starring Patrick Cripps, who's just won the Brownlow medal. Sam Walsh, we know how good he is. And then supported by Chera, Hewitt, and now Blake Akers. There's consolidated depth now. Carlton went 8-2 and two last year, and it all kind of derailed a little bit after that. But to be honest, I'm choosing to look at that more optimistically because of the trajectory that I think they're on talent-wise. Oh, and thankfully, after a lot of bad predictions and some good ones, I think this is probably my best prediction I had Carlton in the top four and they finished fifth and made a prelim. So I'll give myself a tick for that. Please, no one else is going to. I did highlight at the start of the year, I see a potential for Carlton to explode um, with, you know, I think they've got a lot of the ingredients there for a very, very good team that is going to contend for a flag sooner rather than later. This was the year that they clicked. Obviously, you know, started the year really poorly. Midway through the year, they completely explode, beat just about everyone of note. And in my opinion, probably on the cusp of something serious. In third spot, I have the Brisbane Lions. And going through this analysis, um, it's a strong case to be made that this side has the best tw best 22 in the competition right now and their depth is solid as well so it's very easy to make the case why brisbane will be a big contender um you know already a strong team has added josh dunkley jack gunston will ashcroft through the draft and jasper fletcher as well fletcher i don't know how much impact he'll have this year but ashcroft i think will have an impact this year it's an elite midfield and it's a dangerous forward line now i think the lions will be a strong home and away side once again, that's proven. For them, again, they just need to deliver in finals. I haven't decided whether I think they're capable yet, despite last year's MCG win. So Brisbane, I had in third, and they ended up uh, finishing second on the ladder and being runners up, of course. Uh, got this pretty much right. I don't think that I'll give myself points for that. Brisbane are just a notoriously consistent side, um, so not too hard to bet on them finishing high. Again, strong home and away side, like I said, and their form at the MCG was better this year, so they nearly won the grand final. Credit to them for that. And um, then they also beat... Me oh, no, they lost to Melbourne. They lost all three games at the MCG, but in fairness, they played well in two of them. So we saw growth. We saw this group take a step forward, I think, and um, yeah, uh, sort of got this right. Finishing second at the end of the home and away season, I have the Melbourne Footy Club, and we already know how good Melbourne are. I don't really know how much I need to sell the Melbourne Footy Club to you. It was only 2021. We saw them win a premiership in emphatic fashion, and there hasn't been, you know, veterans sort of retiring or players passing through their prime. Last year, we didn't see the best version of Melbourne. By the end of the year, they were quite flat. They went out in straight sets. They were playing nowhere near their best footy. And you can make the argument they've been found out strategically, but I think it's possible that they were just off as a footy club. I'm backing them in to not only be good this year, but for a number of years to go. And I think they will be one of the biggest contenders this year, if not the biggest. So, yep. So Melbourne, I had second and they finished fourth and out and straight set. So I really am a big fan of Melbourne's potential in that team we saw in 2021. I expected to see that both last year and this year. And unfortunately, we just saw the team roll out a similar season to the previous one. 
Again, you know, it was a season full of promise. They look like one of the best teams in the comp at various points throughout this year. Uh, even halfway through the year, I was saying that. But again, a big misfire in finals. Their finals form hasn't been great. Uh, they haven't played horribly in any of them, I wouldn't say, I don't think. But they haven't won one since the 21 flag. So that has held them back in a big way in the last two years. In first spot, I've got the Geelong Footy Club. Wow, what a boring prediction. The Premiers from last year will finish top of the ladder. Uh, but again, how much do I need to sell you on Geelong? Uh, it's a fantastic best 22. Star started all across the field. Yes, they've lost Selwood. And then they've replenished it famously with Jack Bowes, Tanner Bruin. Don't think they will necessarily decline this year. I could be wrong. It's, it is coming. It is coming. I know we say that every year. It's coming. But I'm going to say not this year. I don't think they'll go back to back. Ah, finally, the Geelong drop off comes just when I don't expect it. Um, I think it's a fashionable thing to drop, uh, have Geelong drop down your predictions every year. And I was reluctant to do that. And I just saw too much firepower in that side. But eventually it would happen. Again, I'm still not convinced that this is the genuinely the end for Geelong. Probably as a premiership contender, but watch next year. They've been active with their list rejuvenation. Probably still going to be a finals contender indefinitely, but uh, there has been a clear push to youth and obviously they were a bit off the pace this year. I've got Melbourne defeating Carlton in the grand final. Just to shake it up a little bit, I think we'll have a surprise grand final. So a Carlton-Melbourne grand final, eh? Uh, it wasn't a million miles off. Uh, the, I thought the big call in that was Carlton making it, but they actually got closer than Melbourne. Brownlow medal will be Clayton Oliver. It's time. I said in another video recently, Bont potentially as well, maybe a tie, but if I had to just pick one, I'm going to go Clayton Oliver. Brownlow medal's a tough one. Uh, Clayton Oliver did get injured halfway through the year, and but would he have won it anyway? Probably not. The rising star, I'm going to give you the most boring prediction ever and say Will Ashcroft will win it. I want to say Harry Sheezel just to mix it up a little bit, but Ashcroft's going to come in. He's going to get regular footy. He's going to win plenty of it. He's going to use it well, and the side's going to be good. He's going to stand out. So aside from injury, touch wood, Will Ashcroft will win the Rising Star Award. Ugh, kind of cursed Will Ashcroft here. I uh, don't know if I physically touch wood. That might be my fault, guys. Uh, but, you know, he would have been a great shout for the Rising Star had he not done his ACL. But Sheezel was a deserving winner. And Coleman, boring option. Jeremy Cameron kicked 65 goals, I think, last year in 24 games. Geelong will be a good side this year as well. Maybe Carlton find a few other avenues to go other than Mackay and Kurnow who are in theory competing with each other again. So, yep, uh, Jeremy Cameron as a Coleman medal shout, not too bad. You know, he started the year unbelievably well and Geelong had a drop off this year and I expected Kerno to kick less goals because I thought that Carlton Ford line would be sharing more goals this year, but I got that wrong. Charlie Kerno was an unbelievable player. Jeremy Cameron still had a good year. Uh, but geez, how good is Kerno? But anyway, guys, that is that for me reacting to my predictions. Again, a real mixed bag. You're never going to get all of these right. Um, and uh, it's kind of a fun exercise to see what it was like six months ago. What was the vibe on each club? And um, yeah, some, some were good, some were bad. But as always, I appreciate you watching. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That would be much appreciated. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.